scripture for the message is Acts 26, verses 19 to 32. Paul is speaking. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here, testifying to both small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Messiah must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Now as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind most excellent Festus, but I'm speaking true and sound-minded words. The king knows about these things. To him I speak openly, for I'm persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time you would persuade to make me a Christian? Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am also, except for these chains. Then the king rose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. When they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. May God have his blessing to the reading of his word. Christians sound crazy when we make claims like saying because of one man who lived over 2,000 years ago, everything in life is different than it normally appears to us. Everything. What we think is right, what we think is wrong, how we see life and everyone in it, what's life's purpose and meaning, who we really are, everything is different. Now that sounds crazy. And yet as Paul said to the Corinthians, if we are crazy, it's for God. But if we are sound-minded, it's for you. To be sound-minded or healthy-minded means, as Paul's going to say a few chapters later to the Corinthians, that we see everything through Jesus. He's the one answer in all of life and everything has to be understood in terms of him. How can a man be that important? One man. Well, faith's answer is he is. He's unique. He's the only person who lived for everybody else that will ever live. It may sound crazy or impossible, but it's true. And the same Jesus can work through our lives and make us his witnesses today. That's what Paul's lifting up in our text. He's talking to King Agrippa, Festus, the Roman governor, and a bunch of the leading dignitaries. And he had been describing, uh, last week we looked at how his life had changed on the Damascus Road as he was going to kill and imprison more Christians, he instead has this vision of Jesus. And he continues now where we pick him up. So I did not become unfaithful to this heavenly vision. He goes on to say in Damascus, Jerusalem, Judea, and Gentile lands, he declared repentance. Remember, that's not just being sad, but it's a change of the way we live. He declared repentance and turning upon God while doing works that are worthy of repentance. While doing these things, he said, the Jews seized him in the temple and tried to violently kill him. And yet, he says, up to this day, I've experienced the help that comes from God, and that's why I'm standing here today witnessing to small and great saying nothing outside of what the prophets said was going to occur in Moses 2. And 
what did they say? That two things, that the Messiah would suffer, and second, that as being the first one to rise from the dead, he was going to proclaim light both to our people, the Jews, and to the Gentiles. Now this sounds completely crazy to the Roman governor. You're mad, Paul. Your great learning has led you into madness. If I'm trying to picture what Festus is thinking, I think he's kind of saying, well, let me get this straight. This, this Jesus, though he's been dead for years now, you say he's alive, and he appeared to you on the Damascus Road. And you're also saying that people who lived thousands of years before he even came were talking about him. This just sounds crazy uh, to Festus. But Paul simply says, I am not mad, but speak true and sound-minded words. He goes on to kind of a, allude to the fact that he probably wouldn't talk this plainly to an all-Gentile audience, but King Agrippa was known to be a devout Jew, and so he turns his attention there. The king knows these things, to whom I speak plainly. I'm persuaded that none of these things has escaped his attention because they didn't happen in a corner. They weren't hidden somewhere. They were public events. Do you believe the prophets, King Agrippa? I know that you believe. Agrippa says, I, in a short time, you would persuade to make me a Christian. I would pray to God that whether a short or a long time, not only you, but all who hear me this day, would become such as I am also, except for these chains. And so the king gets up, and all Festus and all the dignitaries, and they leave. They sense that Paul's not really a threat, and actually he wants something good for them, but other than that, they don't really understand him. But they say to one another, this man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. And Agrippa says to Festus, this man would have been able to be set free, except he's appealed to Caesar. So he's got to go to Caesar. Now it may seem like madness, but Paul is speaking true and sound-minded words. What we say today as Christians about Jesus may not seem to make much sense either in the world, but that doesn't stop it from being true. Jesus, the first one to rise from the dead and work through our lives and make us his witnesses. Let's hear an unusual example from a boy named Christopher Devine. I'm going to kind of think of this example as a parable, which I'll uh, talk about uh, at the end of it. Christopher was a high school student and he got a different kind of assignment. Write a paper about someone who is over 70. And he thought to himself, I don't know anybody over 70, except my grandparents and they live in Belgium, so, so I can't talk to them very easily. Well, he got a brilliant idea. He would go to a nursing home and he would ask permission to talk to someone. They sent him to room six. Mrs. Murphy was sitting in a chair and she was knitting diligently. So the needles were clicking and ticking. He knocked on the door and she looked up. He explained his uh, assignment to her. Come in, come in, she said. The room, he said, smelled like lemon candy. And he sat on a small corner of the bed. She returned to her knitting. What are you making, he asked, trying to have small talk. God's in my basket, she said. He thought he must not have heard that right, and maybe she didn't hear him, so he asked in a louder voice, uh, what's in your basket? God's in my basket. He looked and he saw where her basket was, and he peered over into it. Oh, he's there, she said. How can you tell? I prayed for him to come, and he has done so. Then she returned to her knitting, and she didn't say another word to him the whole time he was there. So eventually he got the hint, and he left, and as he was out by the, the desk, the lady there, the director, said, What did you think of Mrs. Murphy? I think she's a little crazy, he said. Well, she was first when she arrived. It was when her husband died. She was alone. 
She didn't have any kids. She was 93 years old, and all she wanted to do was die. That was five years ago. Then after a while, she said she wanted peace, and I suggested that she pray for peace. Well, it was a few months after that, she discovered knitting. We had a volunteer come and was showing the residents. So she started knitting socks for everyone in the home. Then at the Christmas fair, she sold over $1,000 worth of socks, wool dolls, sweaters, and blankets. She even volunteered to teach knitting at a local grade school. And the kids liked her so much, they would invite her home about three times a week to come eat dinner with their families. Mrs. Murphy was the most popular resident in our home. But what about now, he asked. Well, she no longer remembers very much. She's forgotten everyone's name. But she can still knit, Christopher said. Yes, and she's at peace. And she repeats one phrase a lot. God's in my basket? Yes, the God of peace. A few weeks later, he received a package in the mail. It was a brown and wool sweater, and there was a note that Mrs. Murphy had passed away in peace. I see this as a parable because we don't have to have dementia in order to have people think we sound odd or crazy with what we're claiming about Jesus. But even with the dementia, was Mrs. Murphy really saying something crazy? Or was she using sound-minded words that were true? They're certainly not logical words, God's in my basket. But maybe there's something deeper than logic. Maybe where logic's memories fade away, there's faith that we're told abides forever. And in that faith somewhere, she knew that God had been working through her to reach out to others with her knitting. So wasn't it true that God's in her basket? Because Jesus is who he is, all life has to be seen in terms of him. All of it, what we think is right, what we think is wrong, what life's purpose and meaning is, who we really are as children of God. Now that may sound crazy to others, oh he just lived 2,000 years ago, how can that be true? But we can reply with Paul, if we're crazy, then it's for God. But if we're sound-minded, it's for you. Jesus is the one person whose life was for everyone else who has ever lived. And may we ask that Jesus, the first one risen from the dead, to work through our lives so that we too may be his witnesses everywhere.